Hello and welcome to the eighth house party featuring some of your favourite authors talking a bit about their domestic skills and talents, uh, the kind of people that they would like to share a house with and also a bit about books and how they incorporate homes and domestic settings into their novels. And we've got a really good guest coming up for you today. We are going to introduce and uh, I will just click the button now. Um, the amazing <laughs> Julie Cohen, author of Dear Thing Together and her most recent book, The Two Lives of Louis and Louise. It's lovely to see you, Julie. Lovely to see you. See you. you look so fresh and sunny and I was hearing some seagulls from you earlier. It's nice. Yeah. It's like being by the seaside. Yeah, so it has been, as I've mentioned a number of times on these house parties, a real godsend being right by the sea. Um, even though the girls are in kind of very active mode at the moment, chucking all sorts of rubbish out of the out of the roofs, they use it to to sort out their nests, and they, you end up with the pavements covered in, well, yeah, crap basically. <laughs> So uh, there we go. Um, we are going to go through uh, your bit about books and a bit about uh, life. And uh, hello, here's uh, Callie going live, waving at us both. Hello, hello. Callie. <laughs> Lovely to see you. Um, we are mainly going to talk about your uh, housemate scenario, which I've asked all of our authors to do. And everyone's been asked to pick three fantasy housemates um, and yours um, have a bit of a, a theme going on without actually telling us uh, where you've picked for each of them to go. Uh, can you introduce your future housemates to us? Sure. Shall I tell you why I had this or shall I, shall I just tell you? Just tell, tell us a bit about them. Oh, okay. Well, well, um, it's they're they're very formative um, people from my young adulthood. Um, I wish that I could have shared a house with all of these people. It would have made um, my life much more interesting. And uh, sharing time with these people as a as a in my teens and twenties really sort of almost made me the person I am today. Um, which yeah. is so <laughs> That's a pretty amazing thing. <laughs> That. <laughs> <laughs> I've just made the image a bit bigger on the screen so people uh, people can start seeing what you are talking about. <laughs> can you see now? I was <laughs> in a huge X-File, that's X-File with a PH, um, when I was in my 20s. I just watched every single episode and I adored them. And I've been re-watching them now too and I just love them. And uh, it's relevant to my novel, uh, The Two Lives of Louis and Louise, because it, my novel is in parallel universes, where in one universe the protagonist Lou is male and in one universe the protagonist Lou is female. And to make, to make the reader know that they were the same person, I had to sort of put Easter eggs in the text and uh, both of them are huge X-Files fans um, and, and they have various things in the book or named after uh, things in the X-Files, characters in the X-Files. So uh, yeah, so I thought, yeah, I want to share a house with the X-Files. Would it be a creepy house that you can imagine sharing with them? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I think we'd have to sort of watch out for the cigarette smoking man. And you know, have like large no smoking signs on all the doors and windows, and you know, obviously keep an eye out for um, UFOs. It, it would be pretty, you know. Also, I think you'd need to check the toilet every now and then just to make sure that Fluke Man wasn't coming up from the sewers again. Um, so yeah, there there would be a lot of creepiness going on, but also you know, fun autopsies, alien autopsies, uh, you know, all sorts of great things like that going on. <laughs> Who would clear up? What kind of housemate are you? Would you be the one tidying up after the alien autopsy? Oh, well, I think Dana Scully would be tidying up after the alien autopsy. She's she strikes me as a very tidy sort of person. <laughs> That's cool. Um, so, what are you like to live with? Um, it depends. If I'm writing a book, I am probably like most authors. I am really, really rubbish to live with. I'm awful to live with. Um, I disappear up to my attic, which is where I am right now. Um, I spend up to 12 hours a day up there, like a, like a bat. And uh, I come, I emerge for food and to grump at my family members. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm 
pretty awful, I think. When I'm not writing a book, I might be a little bit more fun. Um, but yeah, and I do like to cook. So that's the maybe one of the good things about living with me as a housemate is that I like to cook and I love to feed people. Um, so that would be a plus. I think with that in mind, let's go then and show your housemates which of these three picks are you going to pick to spend time with in the kitchen? Okay, so I've got Fox Mulder, Dana Scully, and the the were creature, the were monster. <laughs> um, I don't kitchen, know. I'm, I wasn't an X Files person, so it's it's going whoosh all over my head. <laughs> well, the kitchen. I think I really think that I would choose the were monster for the kitchen, because um, the thing about the were monster okay. and this particular monster that I chose is that he, this is spoilers, I'm afraid, sorry for season 10, um, that he was actually a, a lizard creature, a man-sized lizard creature who was bitten by a human. And so he turns into a human when there's a full moon and he really, really hates it. But I thought he would be great to have in the kitchen because, um, well, initially I thought he was sort of an iguana creature and he would be a vegetarian. So he would make lots of great vegetarian meals but then I rewatched it last night and I found out that actually he's an insectivore but his line is um I'm an insectivore but nobody likes insects so I think he would be quite adventurous in the kitchen you know he would be making interesting meals you know maybe he'd put a few grasshoppers in there but what's a grasshopper or two between friends that's that's fine um and I I, I would like to have him in the kitchen I think as my chef Perfect. That was not what I was expecting, but it, it's a very cool choice. <laughs> also, it's quite warm there. So, you know, if he's cold blooded, that's going to be a, a comfortable place for him to stay. Yeah. Great stuff. Um, so let's switch a little bit from the fictional person who's going to be uh, sharing your kitchen to the fictional characters that you create. How important is home and the domestic setting when you are planning a book like The Two Lives of Louis and Louise? Um, I think the house and the home is incredibly important because it's a reflection of character. And I think in real life, maybe our houses don't reflect our, our innermost selves, but in fiction, they really do. And they are a metaphor for the character. So when I think about a character, I always think very carefully about what their house looks like, um, what sort of furniture they have, uh, whether they own, rent, who they share it with, and what their attitude is about their domestic setting. Um, because I think it's a way of really um, illustrating conflict without saying it outright. Um, so in, in The Two Lives of Louis and Louise, I don't actually talk much about Lou's house because they come home to their childhood home, um, which is quite important to them, um, because their childhood home is on this sort of... Cr um, junction between the working class and the um the ruling class in the town the upper class in the town um, their mother is working class and their father is uh the son of the mill owner that employs almost everybody in the town and so their house is a sort of place of tension between these two classes and um at one point they go to visit their grandparents house which is a huge house up on the hill and it's um it's very cold and classy and and uh, austere with an oil painting of um, their their illustrious ancestor who founded the mill up on the wall and then um and then they go to their best friend's house and their best friends are working class you know which is um much more chaotic and fun but also is you know they don't have anything that's new and there's a lot of deprivation going on um, and there's a lot of uh, problems which are being hidden um, money problems and uh, sort of problems about toxic masculinity and alcohol addiction that are that are being hidden um, within the house too so it's using a house as a metaphor is super important which I, I know you did in house share as well. It is. It's really interesting when you think about the setting and whether it's a real setting or whether it's based on a real place. It kind of that's one of the first decisions I always make because it just gives you so much to work with, you know, whether it's um, not just in the house share, but in my previous um, book as Kate Helm, I had my heroine live in Brighton where I live because of exactly what I'm loving about living in Brighton at the moment, the fact that you have got that perspective. 
that you have got the horizon you can look out there so even in the middle of lockdown you can almost begin to believe that this will pass and the quality of light really matters to her because she's an artist but at the same time where she goes to look at a terrible crime that's been committed is in the forest of dean which is a very mysterious and beautiful but darkly beautiful location and it's you know making those choices sets the whole tone of the novel and it certainly did in louis and louise because although it's a fictional place it's it's not really is it no um louis and louise are from casablanca maine which is very very strongly based on my hometown of rumford maine um which is a mill town in the mountains of western maine and and a lot of the stuff that happens in the book actually there's a strike in the book which really did happen in my hometown and which is still being felt the effects of generations later um so a lot of it was really based on places that i'd been um, but of course you change them then to become more metaphorical. So, you know, something that's a little bit dirty in real life becomes really sort of mucky and, you know, polluted in fiction. You, you exaggerate things in order to make an effect. I was a little bit scared when I was writing it that people from my hometown would be like, oh no, you portrayed it as this horrible place. But I hope that I portrayed it fondly as well, because there's a lot, it's a, it's a really strong and vibrant community. It's one of the things, yeah, it is one of the things I really loved about the book because you have got that sense of depth there of, of history and of context that is the backdrop to these two lives. And then just seeing how those are played out in, in one time, both, both of the characters make bad decisions and have bad decisions acted upon them, but also you have the sense of what that does to the class divide that you've described, what happens in the strike. It's, it's fascinating. I still have no idea how you planned it all. A lot of post-its. That is, that is how you like to do it. I know. So um, I think we'll, we'll kind of move quickly on um, from that just now to just briefly return to the seller game um, because I want to uh, find out of the three characters, obviously we know who's going to join you in the kitchen. I'm intrigued to know who is going to join you in the bedroom of the amazing X-Files house. So do tell. No, seriously, I think anybody who knows, follows me on social media knows the answer to this question. <laughs> <laughs> I have a Gillian Anderson gift for everything. <laughs> I love her. I adore her. I follow her. I just, I just, I dress up as her on occasion. I just want, love her um, in every way possible. And I, she would be in the bedroom because what a goddess. And Dana Scully, the character, is such a great character. She's um, strong, vulnerable brighter than anybody else she's um her role is to be skeptical but she plays with skepticism and faith all through the series and um, she's just really wonderful and complex and uh strong and I, oh i want to be dana scully i love her without the giving birth to alien stuff There is some weird stuff going on at the moment. I don't know whether it is the X Files literally it might uh, be. It's <laughs> interfering. How we do it? There was like weird, spooky it's sounds. Stuff going. <laughs> but we definitely got the picture. Um, so I'm going to segue from there then into a little bit more uh, thinking about some of the other stuff going on um, in your fiction because we have also. Uh, knowing that your next book that's going to come up, and I've just been getting that on the screen. In fact, earlier on, Sarah, you won't be able to see this um, at the moment, Julie, but Sarah said, we've got mega teal coordination going on today. And this especially applies now that I've put up the cover for Spirited because we've got your hair, my dress, and the beautiful cover for Spirited, which is your new book that's coming out later in the year. So this has a kind of otherworldly theme to it, although perhaps, um, you know, I can't give too much away about, uh, about what happens, but uh, you're in a better position to do that without spoilers. So tell us about the setting for Spirited. Uh, Spirited is my first historical novel, and it's set uh, partly on, uh, in Portland, the Isle of Portland, in 1858. 
And it's also set partly in Delhi in India um, in 1857. Um, so it was it, it, actually being on an island was very important for that book to set it on an island where the characters were isolated and felt surrounded on all sides by sea uh, was really important. And then when, when I was doing the um, research for it, I found that they were building the prison there at the time that the book was set. And so that became very important as well, because the book is a lot about freedom. Um, and uh, well, you actually, you find out on page one that the protagonist goes to jail, Viola goes to jail, um, charged with a crime of, um, of pretending to take pictures of, of ghosts. Um, so the, that sort of metaphor of the prison and the island was super important for, for my setting there. But I made up a house for that. I didn't use an actual house. Um, yeah. Did that present problems for you, the historical setting? Because obviously we can take uh, settings from our own lives as you have in Louis and Louise and, you know, in previous books as well. But so much of your book and so much of great writing is about specific details. How, how much of a challenge did you find that when it came to writing Spirited? It was super hard. I have no idea how historical novelists do it all the time. It is so hard because you have to check everything. But then again, it's also sort of liberating because you're making up these things that are in the past. And so you, you can just, I, I think, well, I was told by a historical novelist and I won't, I won't say who, just in case I'm quoting them wrong, but you know, as long as you present it confidently that the reader is going to believe it. Um, so I, I tried to make sure that every detail of the setting was confidently presented and was relevant to what I was trying to say. Um, so, so that I wasn't putting too much, you know, I, I, that, that setting has a, a class aspect as well because the, the um, upper class people live higher and then the villagers and the fishermen live lower and their, their cottages get flooded by the sea, which actually happened. Uh, in the Isle of Portland um, quite a bit. Um, and so so there's that sort of visual class divide between the people um, as well. And, and Spirited is about class too, as well as uh, ghosts and uh, photography and prison and love. Yeah. <laughs> just just a few trivial bits in there then, nothing, nothing of any real significance, so kind of really lightweight. In fact, that does actually bring me on to um, one of the things that you and I have talked about offline many, many times. And up until today, I've mainly been talking to thriller writers, but um, we've both written in the area of the market known as women's fiction. And uh, especially in that area, kind of using the domestic, talking about homes and details of how people live can lead to us being seen in a different way. I mean, in the past, it was Argus Saga. I don't think we've got a new name um, that kind of incorporates that as yet. But I mean, how do you balance that, trying to be um, reviewed seriously and looked at with serious intent with those themes versus wanting to put in the details that signify who we are? Um, let's just be very, very clear that you and I both agree that um, that denigrating a female novelist for writing about the domestic is absolute BS, right? Yeah. We, yeah, you yeah. and I absolutely yeah. agree that, okay? Yeah. Oh, Louis, Louis, fell off. Novel, in anger, in anger yeah. agreement. I like that. It that was terrible. BS. <laughs> Um, yeah. You know, because when a woman writes about the domestic, they are seen as a domestic novelist, and isn't that nice? And a man writes about the domestic, they are shining a powerful light on on everyday existence yeah. and, and philosophical manners of being. So, we we really need to, you know, make it very clear that women writers are awesome, and we can write about whatever the hell we want. So um, that said. <laughs> Um, I think I think having uh, my approach is really to think very carefully, as you said, about setting and use it as a metaphor. Um, don't take things for granted. Don't under, don't think that, you know, everybody lives in a house with an Argo or whatever. It's it's that there are these uh, subtle differences and that these details are actually very important, um, not only just about how we live our day to day lives, but how we philosophically see the entire world around us. Um, so I, I think setting as metaphor is is maybe the way to get around that. Yeah, 
Yeah, no, I mean, it's uh, you are obviously uh, preaching to the choir <laughs> on this one and hopefully to some of our uh, readers as well and our viewers as we watch. But um, yeah, it is amazing how you get that difference. And I think that that there is that difference when uh, thriller writers talk about domestic noir, uh, which is one of the labels that certain psychological thrillers have been given. It, it doesn't have that same, well, um, prejudice against it because um those books have sold really well because they are set in recognizable worlds but crime writing is not viewed um or reviewed in the same way that that really kind of over emphasizes the gender of the author yeah no it's not i mean not as much it still is yeah, there's still some of it there. all the time <laughs> yeah yeah but I, it was it's really worth saying and uh, I loved how you say it, how you said it yeah and how the books agreed and um, so obviously we would like to consign pretty much everyone who judges us on those terms to the seller uh, but there is one last person from your housemate choices that you are going to put in the seller as well um, through a non x files uh, style process of elimination we will have worked out who that is but tell me why uh well see fox Mulder actually lives in the cellar i mean his his office in the fbi the x-files are based in the basement so he just sort of does all his best work there and i just see him you know down in the cellar with his big you know i want to believe poster he's showing us all the slides of Bigfoot. He's, you know, throwing pencils at the ceiling. He's eating his, his sunflower seeds. He, he likes the basement, Fox. He, he likes it down there. So, you know, he's, he's all right. You, you know, every now and then we'll bring him some food. The aliens will come, you know, and hang out with him. <laughs> he's, he, he's all right down there. You know, I'm, I'm not torturing him down there. I think, I think he's doing good work. So you're not going to have to lock him down. We'll let him up so he can hang out with us and sort of mansplain stuff to us and then he can go back down. <laughs> so will the, will the kind of being put back in the cellar coincide with mansplaining? Do you think that will teach him the odd lesson? Yeah, he'll come up, he'll mansplain to us a bit. Me and Dan will be like, oh yeah, okay, right. And then he'll go back down. We're like, good, good Fox, off you go, back to your X-Files. Yeah. Oh, so we've got a we've got a little bit here of, um, in fact, Russell is making a statement on what we were saying about uh, female writing uh, and or writers who happen to be female. Uh, Russell is saying, uh, I prefer female writers without sounding sexist. They seem to have a deeper insight. Well, we're not going to disagree with that one, are we? Necessarily, although I suppose in itself that is stereotyping. I think I think that writers um, that of any gender have their own particular insights and they're writing for their own particular purposes but I, what i think what i think is a shame is um when female writers are um viewed in a particular in, in a very gendered way um by reviewers and by readers that isn't necessarily true so i th i think female writers whether they have more insight or not are often pigeonholed much more than uh male writers are and that leads me neatly into a, a plug to end this session or a couple of plugs. And one of them is obviously for The Two Lives of Louis and Louise, which is both a, a fantastically enjoyable novel in its own right, but also a really smart and sharp dissection of the effect that, that gender can have on lives. And I, I love it for that reason. Uh, really, really recommend you get hold of that one. Um, and obviously I have been organizing my house share parties partly because uh, I have got my own novel out <laughs> uh, called The House Share, uh, which obviously uh, revolves around some nightmare flatmates in the perfect house. I mean, it literally is a home to die for, out now available at all good online bookstores, as well as Asda. Um, and Asda are selling lots of copies of that at the moment. So if you want to get hold of it, then uh, you know where to go along with buying your Lou Rolls or whatever else is on your list. Um, thanks so much for joining me, Julie. Tomorrow we have uh, another fantastic writer. This will be the ninth guest that I have had in my literary house parties. It's the wonderful Susie or SJI Holiday, author of Violet. So I'm looking forward to her house share confessions and much, much more. 
Um, it's been great to have you with us today. Thanks for all the comments. Remember that you can also watch all of the videos in this series on Facebook, as well as on my YouTube channel, Kate Wright's Books, and you can uh, subscribe as well. You can follow and then you'll be alerted um, when I'm doing these interviews uh, in future, because I'm hoping it will be something that we can do pretty regularly. But for, for now, get out there and enjoy the sunshine. That's certainly what I'm going to do. And uh, thanks for stopping by. Bye for now. <laughs>